Bob, it's Musa Maggie here on the fan. Thanks so much for carving out some time for us today. Hello, Eminem. <laughs> Great to be with you, BC. The thing is, we loved when you gave the quotes to the New York Post about how you like this idea about baseball expanding the postseason. But one of the things you said in that article was that you also think baseball is expanding to 32 teams very quickly. What cities do you think MLB should target, Bob? Well, I don't know about how quickly, but ultimately I think that's where they wind up. Uh, Portland is a possible city. Nashville is a possible city. I say this with respect for diehard Rays fans and for what that organization has consistently been able to do with such limited resources, but it might make more sense for the Rays to relocate to Montreal if and when they get a ballpark there. They'd have more natural geographic rivalries with Toronto, Boston, and New York, and I think they'd have a more substantial fan base. So uh, you've got a relocation possibility. You've got a couple of uh, markets, perhaps in Nashville and in Portland, that would make sense. And if and when baseball goes to 32, then what I would favor would be a schedule that made sense with two divisions of eight in each league, and both division winners under a new playoff format would get a first round bye past that best out of three proposed wild card round, and the four wild cards would play each other. And then uh, you could have the same TV show that, if you wanted to, that they proposed. The highest ranking wild card could pick its opponent, and then you could let the highest ranking of the two division winners pick its opponent in the division round. Um, until expansion, you could also consider this which is you've got three divisions per league. You could go, instead of from five to seven, you could go from five to six and give buys to the first two division winners. The least of the three division winners would then go into the first round, the wild card round. It would be able to pick its opponent, and, and there you go. So you'd have, you'd have six playoff teams instead of five, and that might, to some people, make a little bit more sense. It would also, I think, put a greater premium on the regular season because you'd have two buys among the division winners. But the idea is that the basic concept that they're throwing out there, expanding the playoffs intelligently, we hope, and adding this element of intrigue and strategy and a television show, yes, where some of the participating teams get to pick their opponents. That creates a whole lot of baseball talk. Plus, just as importantly, you're creating additional postseason um, opportunities for television and more elimination games, which in this era attract more eyeballs. So it makes sense from the standpoint of television and marketing. We could, you know, debate exactly how to enact it, but the basic concept, I think, makes sense. You know, Bob, we're in agreement. Maggie yep. and I are in agreement. We went to the calls yesterday, and the, the baseball fans in this area couldn't stand it. Uh, they don't want to see expansion uh, of the baseball playoffs in any way. They like the way that it is now. You know, I understand if you expand it and you add two teams, it could change everything. You ran through it a little bit, Bob. Why do you think it works? Why Why do you think it – do you think right now if it's just the 30 teams, if you go on the idea of what they're thinking about doing in 2022, why do you think expansion and baseball playoff expansion works? Well, the, the reason the concept works is that you give more markets uh, and their fans, in theory, a shot at the postseason. In theory, it decreases the incentive to tank, which too many teams are doing these days, because if you can win in the mid-80s, you've at least got a shot uh, at making the postseason. And it creates the additional, um, the additional inventory for the television networks, and therefore more revenue for baseball overall, and more elimination games by adding uh, a best two out of three uh, wild card round, more elimination games. Uh, that should be appealing to casual fans and to the television networks. As I said, the only question in my mind about it is, how are you going to implement it? They threw an idea out there. It has some merit. Is that the final place they wind up? Maybe we should talk about it. Yeah, I always think that the leagues throw out these kind of weather balloons, sort of test to see what the reaction is and maybe go back with a fine-tooth comb. And when we were getting calls about it, Bob, and you grew up in this area, so you're familiar with the WFAN caller. Um, but really the sticking point was the idea that below 500 teams would end up making the postseason. So if you look back over the last eight years, if this the, the, the proposal they put out 
If that was in place, five teams over the last eight years would have made the postseason with a below 500 record. Would that bother you at all? Yeah, I wouldn't be thrilled with it, but it's a concession to modern realities. Something else that I floated out there, um, why should the division series, which is the only one by definition, even under the present setup, that includes a wild card qualifier and the third best division winner, why should that one be a best of five and the LCS and World Series best of seven when best of five obviously leads to the possibility of a flukier result? So what you could do under any setup, whether it's the present setup or some kind of expanded playoff thing, reduce the schedule to 156 games, which basically is one home series, one three-game series for each team. And implement the best of three wild card idea, which I definitely approve of, and then make the division series a best out of seven. But here's the key. The team that had the best record in the league in this best of seven, it's 2-2-3 two, two, instead of the standard 2-3-2. Two, two. So you further advantage the team with the best record. Potentially in a seven-game series, they have five home games. You appropriately further disadvantage a wild card qualifier. Um, and yet it's not an impossible hill to climb. It's just an appropriately more difficult hill to climb. And now you've added even additional postseason revenue, but not in a gimmicky way, in a way that actually respects the long regular season. Mm. Bob, were I, like you, were, yeah, I like that idea. Were, were you surprised, Bob? I mean, and, and you do a great job now on MLB Network and, you know, and call games and, and, and your commentary and the like. Were you surprised that when Trevor Bauer tweets out the criticism of Manfred that he tweeted out when this idea got floated out there when the story was broke by Sherman in the Post? I don't know Trevor Bauer personally, but based on what I know, I'm not surprised by anything he does or says. <laughs> Um, that's fair, but I mean, you look at it, the the concern I, I think for some baseball fans would be minimizing the regular season. It's a long season, and if, right. if you stick it with 162, if you don't change it, it's, it says it's at a buck 62. And going on the idea that it's 30 teams, 14 of the 30 teams are going to be in the playoffs. You know, there are similar concerns when you look at the National Hockey League, when you look at the NBA, minimizing the impact of the regular season, and it's longer in baseball than those other two leagues, Bob. Or is there any concern about that where you're letting too many teams in after and minimizing the regular season? Yeah, I think it's a legitimate concern, and you've got to balance it against modern-day television realities and marketing realities and baseball fighting for its place in the television marketplace and the sports marketplace in a way that it didn't have to way back when, when it was the unquestioned national pastime, and when even daytime midweek World Series games got ratings in the 30s. You know, I'll flash you back a little bit. It's more than 30 years, but it's within our lifetimes. In 1986, Game 7 of the World Series between the Mets and the Red Sox, scheduled for a Sunday night, got rained out. They played Game 7 on a Monday night against Washington and the Giants and Monday Night Football. The Monday Night Football game got a rating in the single digits, and Mets Red Sox Game 7 got like a 35 or a 36. Mm. We now live in a different world, and baseball is trying to maintain some understandable connection to its traditions, but at the same time respond to modern-day conditions. And I think that's why, I'm not going to reiterate it, but what we just talked about yep. prior to this tries to take that into account, tries to take into account the importance of the regular season and baseball's tradition of a pennant race as opposed to mere playoff qualifying. You have to have some nod to that, even as you modernize and expand. We're talking with Bob Costas. And Bob, from when the Astros story initially broke to now, have your thoughts on the scandal and the stain it could leave on baseball? Has it changed at all? Yeah, because we're not sure if we know the full story. I'm satisfied that we know the full story of 2017. We might not know uh, all of the players involved because they had to grant them an effect immunity for truthful and full testimony. But I'm satisfied that we know what happened in 2017. We haven't got the Red Sox report yet about 2018. And although I'm not a conspiracy theorist, the Astros have forfeited the benefit of the doubt. And so whatever may be floating out there about buzzers or other means of cheating in 2019 can't be immediately dismissed out of hand. If there's a culture of cheating, then you can't dismiss the possibility that they would have tried to cheat in different ways.
But I agree with you, Bob. I, I was someone who thought that the buzzers was at first. I thought, man, this is really connecting dots that are. It's a little bit of a stretch, too much. And then the AJ Hinch interview happens on MLB Network. And his answer or non-answer to the buzzer's question from Tom Verducci made me think, all right, maybe there's something there. Yeah, I like A.J. very much personally. I think his contrition is absolutely sincere. And I think that at some point down the road, both he and Alex Cora, because of their youth and because of their accomplishments and because of their general likability, will be back in the game. But the answer to that one question, as you said, Maggie, uh, begs, other questions, because what you could have said was, absolutely, I would have known about it if it was happening. I would not have approved of it. I, it didn't happen. I didn't, or if it did happen, I knew absolutely nothing about it. Bob, that's, how, not what he, that's not what he said. No. That is not what he said. Bob, how do you view their championship in 17, the Astros title? Tainted. Tainted. And everybody will make whatever judgments. You know, just like Barry Bonds' single season and career home run records are tainted, as are the, the gargantuan numbers of Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire and whomever. And you don't need an official asterisk or expunging of a championship or a record uh, for knowledgeable fans to make their own judgment. I guess they could. They can't award it to the Dodgers, because who's to say that the Yankees or someone else wouldn't have beaten them in 2017 in prior rounds of the playoffs. But you could, in theory, vacate the title with an explanation for history's sake, you could, in theory, um, well, you don't have to do it. i, I got to check myself here. The, the, Reds, the Reds won the World Series, so you can't take it away from the White Sox in, or the Black Sox in, in 1919. But everybody kind of knows what happened. So in, even though the Reds weren't guilty, in some sense they know it was a fraudulent World Series, and people just... We're talking with Bob Costas. He's our guest talking a lot of baseball. And, Bob, you know, don't want to be so negative with pitchers and catchers reporting and obviously a lot of hope with spring training. But what do you think the biggest issue is facing baseball right now? Because, you know, for Rob Manfred, there's a lot on his plate uh, in terms of getting your arms around this sign-stealing scandal and all the drips that keep keep coming out from that mm -hmm. in terms of the baseball, which, listen, you can do every scientific report you want. We know what we saw. You know, that yeah. the baseball was different. Uh, uh, another story that doesn't get as much attention, but is one that's not that great for baseball, the contracting of all the minor league franchises. I mean, what, what is the biggest thing facing baseball right now in terms of obstacles, or, or what do you think is keeping Rob Manfred up at night? Rattled off a bunch of them. I think there's a half dozen or so issues that will define his commissionership right now. Just in the present atmosphere, I think it's the restoration of belief in the integrity of the competition. There's also the pace of play issue. And are we opening up a Pandora's box with the face three batters rule? Mm -hmm. What if that's in effect? I understand the impetus behind it, and it may have some merit. But let's say that's in effect during the World Series. And you bring some guy in who you think can face at least three batters. First batter doubles off the wall. Next guy draws a walk. Up comes the next guy. You got to leave him in there. You got to leave him. It's the World Series. Yep. It's not some dreary game in June that you just want to get over with. It's the World Series. You know that that that's going to raise some questions about unintended consequences. But pace of, pace of play is is one. Contraction of the minors is a complicated issue that we won't get into in in full here. But it is one that baseball has to grapple with. Uh, and as you said, Maggie, the baseball itself, I do not believe that there was anything done purposefully in some clandestine way by baseball just to jack up offense. Offense is already at high enough levels. But there was a difference in the baseball. Everybody knew it from one year to the next. So hopefully they can get that uh, back to, to some sort of level of normalcy uh, going into, into 2020. So that's one of many issues that baseball has to deal with. And you know, Rob Manfred's a big boy. He knew that. He knew that there would be issues. Pete Rose is going to come up again, not because Pete's own circumstances changed, but because based on the punishments others have received, admittedly for different offenses, differently defined in their time, but a lot of baseball fans don't believe for a moment that Pete is innocent or should have been treated with kid gloves. They believe that he should be remain banned from baseball in terms of any official employment from baseball but they believe that his name should be on the Hall of Fame ballot. 
They believe that justice should be tempered by mercy and common sense. And that rule, by the way, did not pre-exist or predate Pete's uh, offenses. It was clearly posted in every big league clubhouse that betting on any game in which you were involved carried with it permanent banishment. That included umpires, players, and betting on any game, baseball game, in which you were not directly involved carried a one-year suspension. So Pete got what the rule called for, but that was 1989. In 1991, the Hall of Fame put in what, in effect, was an ex post facto law for Pete Rose that said anybody on the permanently ineligible list was ineligible for the Hall of Fame ballot. Now, that couldn't possibly have been aimed at Joe Jackson, who had been dead since <laughs> yeah, 1950 right. and likely remains dead <laughs> into the future. So it's all about Pete Rose. Yeah. <laughs> hey, by the uh, way, Bob, thanks for yeah. bringing up Pete Rose yeah. on a sports talk radio yeah. show. Yeah, that, just that, to that, let you know. Was, I'm just I'm just trying to help. Yeah, we we will not be taking any Pete Rose yeah. phone calls today, <laughs> no matter what. Uh, but but thank you for opening that. You yeah, know, you got op eds about him in the New York Times in, within the last week. I'm like, oh my yeah, goodness. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, Bob. Uh, you know, from I mean, we're all huge baseball fans. But you know, you brought and you referenced the ratings um, in, in terms of the the World Series game and the Monday Night Affair. I, I'm curious to what you know. We've all debated. And you ran through a number of the issues, and Maggie uh, highlighted them as well, Bob. Why do you think the popularity, there's been such a precipitous drop in the popularity of baseball across the country? I think attention spans have a lot to do with it. Uh, baseball always had a leisurely pace, and each of its games, because you play so many, are not seemingly as important. They can't possibly be as important as each football game during the NFL season, where they play about a tenth as many games. But Baseball always had a somewhat slower pace, but that used to be a pleasing leisurely pace. And now too often, and baseball officials know this, it's a lethargic pace, which would be a problem in any era. If games were, if four to two games were taking nearly four hours in some cases and averaging over three hours. But in this era, where people's attention spans are being reduced to that of a flea, it's, it's a problem. Bob, we've taken up a lot of your time, but I just want to switch gears for one second, and sure. thank you for being such a gracious guest. Uh, you've been outspoken about player safety in the NFL. You're mm -hmm. hearing now a 17-game schedule could be a reality moving forward with the new CBA negotiations that are going on in the NFL. Yeah. What do you think about that? When you heard that news, you thought what? I think it's almost inevitable. There's more revenue involved. They'll probably expand uh, the playoffs. In some fashion, they'll add an additional bye week for each team. They'll add um, roster slots uh, to make up for the expected attrition, injury attrition of one kind or another that takes place over the course of the season. And they'll probably wind up playing the Super Bowl on President's Weekend so that not only Sunday becomes, in effect, an unofficial national holiday, but there actually will be a holiday to take care of your hangover the next day. <laughs> you know, it, it, all, it all makes sense because football is uh, a juggernaut. It's not just the colossus of sports. It's the colossus of American entertainment. And a time when everything is fractionalized, this is the thing outside of the Olympics that pulls together the consistently gargantuan audiences, not just in the postseason, but the late Sunday afternoon games or the Sunday night games on NBC. So the NFL can pretty much write its own ticket, and I think the 17-game season is inevitable. I just hope that they do it as logically as possible, and from what I understand, it seems like they're pointed in that direction. They are pointed in that right direction, but Bob, do you think down the line here, we're going to see the impact of concussions? I mean, you're seeing the retirement of Luke Keekley after eight years. We've seen more and more early retirements in the National Football League. It's still a massive problem when you're looking at CTE and concussions yeah. in the NFL. Yeah, no question about it. What you're going to see more and more is especially players who have had at least one big contract. So if they're smart about their money, they're financially set. They're going to get out, in some cases, even while they're still star players, like Luke Keekley. And what you're also going to see is, and we're already seeing it, diminished participation at the youth level, where a lot of people who still want to gamble on football, still want to root for their team, still want to be in their fantasy league, still want to be parked in front of the television set each weekend, but they're going to say, I'm not going to let my kid play. 
And more and more, high schools are going to have difficulty fielding squads. They may have to consolidate schools to field squads. They're going to worry about uh, liability. They can't all have the revenues necessary to have the kind of medical expertise at every game that an NFL or a top Division One game has surrounding it. There's, there, there's a ripple effect here that's going to be felt. Now, does that mean that football hotbeds like Western Pennsylvania and parts of the South and Texas are going to give up their Friday night lights? Of course not. It may take a long time, but eventually I think there's going to be a quantifiable effect, and to some extent there already is. And, and final one, Bob, you have a long history, obviously, with the NBA, but the, the Knicks also, obviously, the 94 finals, you're there, the yep. OJ chase. I mean, it's just it's it's part of the history of this country, let alone just sports. You've seen, though, you know, what's happened with the Knicks over the last 20 years. If you could get in a room with James Dolan, if he asked <laughs> your advice, what should I do? What would you say to him? I don't want to be – I don't want to be snarky. Uh, I don't know James Dolan. Um, I think that if he were to sell the team, that that would be a very popular move in New York. Uh, it would be a very popular move. And, uh, you know, there's still a lot of people around who remember, heck, the 99 team, the eight yeah. seed that got to the finals against the Spurs, let alone Pat Riley's team that almost won it, and the great Red Holzman teams of – a generation or two before that, I mean, we remember when the Gardens sang for basketball, uh, when it really was the Mecca. Um, we'd like to see that come back. Uh, if I had a blueprint, I would run right over to Mr. Dolan and hand it to him, but I don't. Bob, we appreciate the time this morning. Thank uh, you. We thank kept you, for you long, joining but us we, appreciate we appreciate it. it. All right, guys. Good you, to talk with you. Take care. You got it. Thank well. you, Bob. That's Bob Costas, MLB Network Now. I mean, a uh, laundry list of accolades has done it really all. Legendary broadcaster. I Give know. me his thoughts. I mean, it's like you want to ask him about everything. Yeah. You know, we yeah, couldn't and- even get into like the Will Ponds about boxing, about the Olympics, about all the incredible things that he's done. I don't know if we'll ever talk to him again. Well, we kept and, him for 25 and, and minutes. Listen, but- it's such a respected Sorry, voice. Yeah, I mean, it's such a, he's such a respected voice when you hear him talking about the, when you hear him talking about baseball and talking about the fact that the Astros scandal is tainted, but you don't need an asterisk because as a baseball fan or a you sports know. fan, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't need to physically take the title away. And, you know, if you're a still, you know, if you're Jim Crane, you own the Astros, you could say, I don't feel like it's tainted, but you know, deep down, you know, it was. Meanwhile, Jim Crane called all of his position players to camp early so they could have a powwow about what they're going to say to the media when uh, spring training for the Astros at West Palm Beach opens up, I believe, today or tomorrow for the Astros. I believe it's tomorrow, so I think. We're gonna I think hear, he's been with them today. So we're going to hear from a lot of those Astros. Make sure you get on message. Yeah. Get on. Well, we heard from one former position player for the Astros, and we're going to play that next. There's late and the latest uh, surrounding everything about Beltron, his impact down in in 2017 with the Houston Astros. That'll come your way next. Moose and Maggie with you right here, the fan in New York. 